My name is Yaniv Voller, and I'm a senior lecturer in Middle East politics at the University of Kent. And I'm really excited to chair this event under this very promising theme. Uh, the event, of course, has been organized by, by CEFTUS, by the Center for Turkish Studies, which is a London-based independent and non-partisan organization. Um, and and CEFTUS organizes many events about Turkey and the Middle East in general. And, and these events are always thought-provoking and um, they always shed a new light about developments in the region and, and, um, and of course, in, in Turkey. And I think, you know, I think uh, the uh, CEFTUS team and in particular Mr. Mr. Ibrahim Doush, the, the founder of the center, have done a remarkable job in running the center and in attracting attention to its events. So if, if you are not on the CEFTUS um, mailing list, I strongly recommend that you join it and participate in the events and support them in any way that you can. Um, now we have, um, we have three great speakers who have worked extensively on the Middle East and are in a very good position to discuss regional geopolitics post-pandemic, which is again, which is the broad theme for this evening. So um, first of all, allow me to introduce them. So first we have um, Louis Fishman and, and uh, Dr. Fishman is an associate professor in history in the uh, history department at Brooklyn College, City University of New York. He's the author of the book, Jews and Palestinians in the late Ottoman era, 1908 till 1914, Claiming the Homeland, which was published in 2020 by Edinburgh University Press. Um, Dr. Fisher's academic, uh, Fishman's sorry, academic work focuses on late Ottoman Palestine, the Jews of the Ottoman Empire, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, Dr. Fishman is also a regular contributor to the Israeli newspaper Aretz, where he writes mostly about Turkish and Israeli politics, and he divides his time between New York, Istanbul, and Tel Aviv, which sounds perfectly. Uh, our second speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Selim Nassi, and uh, Dr. Nassi is the London representative of the Ankara Policy Center. She received her PhD in political science and international relations from Boazic University in 2020 with a doctoral dissertation, Turkey's Israel policy in the post-Cold War, the struggle of identity over uh, realpolitik. Formerly, Dr. Nassi worked as a columnist at uh, Hurrier Daily News uh, between 2015 and 2018 and um, uh, for Shalom, the weekly newspaper for Turkey's Jewish community between the years 2013 and 2018. And finally, we have Dr. Galia Lindenstrauss. And uh, Dr. Lindenstrauss, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Lindenstrauss is a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies and specializes in Turkish foreign policy. Her additional research interests are ethnic conflicts, Azerbaijan's foreign policy, the Cyprus issue, and the Kurds. She has written extensively on, uh, on these topics, and her commentaries and op-eds have appeared uh, in all of the uh, um, Israeli major media outlets, as well as in international outlets, such as uh, National Interest, uh, who hear daily news, Turkey Analyst, and Inside Turkey. Dr. Lyndon Strauss completed her PhD in the Department of International Relations at Hebrew University, and she formerly lectured at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and at the, uh, at the uh, Interdisciplinary Center in Erzilia, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Elona Davis Institute for International Relations at the Hebrew University, and a visiting fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, DC. So again, three experts in their field, and I'm sure that we're going to have a, a brilliant discussion. Uh, so I'm going to start with Dr. Fishman, followed by Dr. Nassi, and we'll end with Dr. Lyndon Strauss. And, um, after the presentations, we'll have some time for a Q&A session. So if you, if you can, please write any question that you may have in the chat, and I'll address these questions to the speaker. So, um, Louis, uh, can you can go ahead? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks so much for Zeftus for having me, and thanks, Ibrahim. Um, we haven't seen each other since I was last in, in London a few years back when when you uh, so uh, you hosted me to be there. To tell the truth, I wish I would be in London right now, not stuck in my apartment in Brooklyn. 
But of course, the good good part of this is that we're able to bring people from different places. And many of uh, people here are some friends, so good to see you, including the speakers. Love to be on the panel with all with all of you. It's a, it's a real honor. Okay, let me go ahead. Um, I did, I'm going to share a PowerPoint for you. Now, just be prepared that um, my students complained to me this year after teaching for about 12 to 15 years that I never do PowerPoints. And then I started finally doing PowerPoints and I found, wow, they really helped me focus and stay on topic. Um, so the Zoom era has introduced me to the power of the PowerPoint and hopefully this will work out. And I actually only have a five or six slides. I'm gonna speak about 10 minutes or so, um, 10, 15 minutes at the most. And then we can move on. Now, I think, you know, what, what got me about the topic itself, what's next in the Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean in the post pandemic is that I imagine if we were doing this talk 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we would be talking about the Middle East itself. And I think that's, you know, the idea that I'm going to be on a panel of Eastern Mediterranean was, 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 you know, was a bit worrying to me. I said, well, Eastern Mediterranean, I do the, I do the Middle East. I do, I do Palestine, Israel, Turkey, different things. But of course there's overlapping Egypt. And um, I think there's some really good, um, I think it's a good change in a sense that we do refocus ourselves on the, on the Eastern Mediterranean, but also at the same time, remembering that this is connected way beyond the Eastern Mediterranean and deep into you know, different different regions within the Middle East. If you look at UAE, Qatar and the Gulf states and stuff like that. So we have this picture where everything is so connected. The second thing I thought of was, it brought me reminisce, uh, you know, when I was thinking about this, was um, the first time I came to Turkey way back in uh, 1999, I was at Bilkin. And I remember then um, the big thing was, the big discussions, you know, bilateral talks between Israel and Turkey were the issue of water. And they had a lot of meetings and I was privy to, to being on discussions about the issues of Turkey going to, to import water to Israel. Well, at the same time um, in Istanbul and other places, there were daily water outages um, in, in the city. And I always thought, how, how would you be able to sell this to your own public if you don't have water for your own residents that you're selling water? But I quickly learned a lot that in, in, in this um, realm of work, um, people talk big and oftentimes nothing really comes out of it. So I think that should be, I think that's really important that, that we have to really be careful from falling trapped to, and I'll talk about this in a few different slides here. So the first thing that I will, let me go ahead and go full screen here. Give you to give you the full effect. One second. There we go. So, like I said, I only have five or six things. So we're talking post-pandemic, but as a historian, I really wanted to go back. And I thought to myself, well, in 2000, it was the issue of of, of water. This was the pre-AKP period, pre-Erdogan period. And the height of Erdogan in the region, you could argue, was 2011. And that's when he um, visited Egypt uh, very proudly as sort of, you know, the new regional leader. That this is after uh, Mubarak had uh, stepped down and uh, before Morsi, a strong ally of his, um, um, had become president. And I call it the, 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 Erdogan, uh, the Erdogan effect. No, excuse me, I, I took a clip of the article that was written by two policy people, very pro-gov policy um, from SETA. And uh, the article they had, um, had written for this one policy um, journal in Cairo was, was called the Erdogan effect. Uh, Egypt and the future of the Middle East um, Turkey has adopted proactive foreign policy in support of democracy in the Middle East. Together with a democratic and economically strong Egypt, Turkey can help Arab countries forge an integrated regional order. So we'll come back to this. But in while um, Erdogan was in uh, Cairo during this time, he this is the quote he said, the freedom message spreading from Tahrir Square has become a light of hope for all the oppressed through Tripoli, Damascus, and Sana'a. 
He told an audience at the Cairo Opera House, quote, governments have to get, get their legitimacy from the people's will. This is the core of Turkey's politics in the region. Equally, Erdogan's tour demonstrated Turkey's recognition of the regional shift. He signaled that Israel no longer be shielded from accountability of uh, accountability by a strategic status quo that buffeted authoritarian Arab rulers like President Hosni Mubarak of Egypt. Erdogan's message to Israel emphasized human rights, democracy, and the rule of law as the true parameters of regional balance of power. Quote, according to Erdogan, Israel must respect human rights and act as a normal country, and then it will be liberated from its isolation. Well, we all know the we, we all know the in story here. Um, and before I move to the next slide, the in story is that it, you know, Israel must respect human rights and act as a normal country. I completely agree with that that statement. Anyone that knows me um, knows regularly I, I talk about the numerous human rights violations that Israel commits on a daily basis through the occupation. But the second part is more interesting for us, and then it will be liberated from its isolation. Well, I think today, 10 years from now, 10 years later, uh, you could really switch this to Turkey must respect human rights and act as a normal country, and then be liberated from its isolation. Because 10 years later, we see it is Turkey that has become completely isolated, while Israel has been, you know, flourishing with with ties that we'll talk about in a second. Now, this is where we are in 2020, when I talk about Turkish isolation. And I'm not, I'm gonna leave it to political scientists to explain this map. This is, this is where the historian and the commentator um, throws the work to, a, to more intelligent people. But I just quote, Egypt, Israel, this is from Reuters article in 2020, Egypt, Israel, Greece, Cyprus, Italy, and Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority, Establish the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, form as an intergovernmental organization in a virtual ceremony hosted by Cairo in um, virtual during the Zoom era, of course, um, which makes it much easier, I think, for international relations not to have to make all the uh, arguments of who will sit where. Um, so they're assigned this. Now, it's very interesting around the same time. Israel also um, was in discussions with Lebanon about the market demarketization zone and lines and things like this. So we see that this is really, like I said, 10 years later, or this was nine years later, um, Turkey has found itself completely nice. Now, this is what I was talking about. Maybe we have to be careful about uh, big headlines. And I remember when this happened, the, the, the news report came out in 2014, and it said Turkey's Zordo holding to build natural gas pipeline from Israel to Turkey. Wow, were people excited. Um, that's it. Israel and Turkey are going to put their differences aside. Um, numerous articles came out. I forgot to put my cynical tweet here about, uh, well, I actually said that in 2020, when they talked about something I said, well, we, we we remember what what happened with Zordo, and I remember when this when this happened, and I and you know that's when I actually went back and and thought about the water, the, the deals with the water. You know, everyone saying it's just you know they're going to float huge bags of water to Israel, and Israel is going to solve its water problem. Well, we know what the we know what this is very connected also, and this is part of Netanyahu's I think energy revolution. We could talk about. Uh, and the quote was from the article that in 2016 by Ibar Skorgul and Sabiha Senyujev Gundara, quote, besides regional dy dynamics, the Israel-Turkey re reconciliation can be fully understood, cannot be fully understood without consider considering energy-related factors. Energy politics is not independent from regional and strategic issues, and cooperation regarding energy is likely to put on the agenda of both countries for various reasons. It's likely to be put on the agenda of both countries for various reasons. Put simply, Israel is looking to export its gas and benefit from gas wealth, while Turkey is seeking alternatives to meet its gas demand. And you can buy, you can find numerous articles of such. So why the situation? And I think we're going to spend a, I think I have about five minutes hopefully, 
Um, I'm on time, everything's fine, perfect. But um, so why the situation today? Why is Turkey so isolated? And, you know, I have to say that, that even my talk in, um, in Seftus a couple years back, I think I was a lot more, um, I wouldn't want to say optimistic, but cautious optimistic that, that Turkey can take its turn, a turn for, for itself or uh, better. So I would start off by saying Turkey's hard pod, hardball politics, um, international politics, which seem to be completely endorsed by its foreign minister, minister Mehmet Çavuşoğlu, has proven time again to have failed. And I think this is something that uh, we, we can't we can put this aside. A Çavuşoğlu, in my opinion, has brought Turkey to a very low point in terms of, of, of international politics. And um, he, he does get along great with some people in Europe and has, I would even say from, from what, of course, I don't know anyone involved, but I would even sometimes see chummy politics, politics between the guys and they can, they can laugh, smile and, and hang out. Um, they like each other. I think he's uh, very likable. But over, over, over time, I, I, don't, I don't think um, uh, it's been really positive uh, whatsoever. And, it's, and it, it is sort of, you know, that sort of hit hard and pull back type of politics. Um, and I think over time, it, it's, paid, it's cost Turkey a lot. The second thing is Turkey's domestic instability is raiding outward with its constant changing of its diplomatic outreach. So what's happening inside the country is raiding, radiating out. This is exacerbated by negating interest, uh, by the negating interest of Erdogan's top echelon. So I use example of the Turkey's directive of communications. Um, you know, we have since the pres presidential system that have come in, we have presidential advisors, we have presidential offices that aren't part of the normal government. And I think they're really ex exacerbating um, the tensions. So yes, they make great films. I have to tell you, if you watch any of the director of communications films, whether it's how they're the great power in the Mediterranean or how they're going to, how they crown El Aqsa Mosque as being Turkey's basic in one of the video. Um, it really is bad for public relations. It just doesn't do that the thing. So yes, it gets a lot of hits and clicks and that, that pure Turkish pride that's coming out, you know, Erdogan's uh, uh, coalition with the, the MH, MHP and very nationalist groups. They love it, right? It's, it's sort of a mixing of Islam and nationalism, but uh, it doesn't go well, very well abroad. Uh, Turkey succeeded in making itself um, relevant through, con uh, through conflict. And that goes back to hard politics. You know, in, in retrospect, you could argue that, that Turkey gained um, some prestige in the region, especially with Libya. I don't think anyone thought um, it would come out on on way it did, and and Turkey um, standing above, I would say. Uh, so, but that also comes at a cost. The question is, what would have happened if the another path had been taken? Had, did we actually need it to come to this for them to make make gains in in in, in, in their prestige? Um, Turkey is. I only have two more things, and then last slide. Turkey's re recent overtures to the EU contradict contradict both internal and foreign moves. So even if we're looking you know, really interested in making overtures to the EU, you know, the same day they have a human rights rights package. They they have people in the top echelons of the government speaking against the LGBT community. And I use that as internally because that has a price abroad. That's especially in, in Europe. Now it is, um, and, and I would say now it's working out damage control. Overtures that are made to Israel and Egypt. The last two things, Israel and Turkey, uh, Israel and Turkey, um, what about that? So we had the removal of amb ambassadors following Trump's moving of embassy to Jerusalem. There were reports that a new appointment to Tel Aviv was, in, uh, was just going to happen in, in December. And I think once again here, a choice of, uh, of, of ambassadors and someone that was quite active, and, and I would even say an a activist um, that um, is very close to the government and very, very anti-Israel. In his words, um, I don't think that is a new beginning at all, but we haven't heard anything um, that's happened since. And we'll, we'll see it. Um, the person is, is definitely capable, I would say, 
knowing the country and finishing at the Hebrew University. Turkey completely misread Israel's regional potential over the last couple of years, which has perhaps been Netanyahu's greatest successes. Although I say today's crisis with Jordan, anyone watching the news um, shows its limitations also. But we have uh, Israel now as having uh, relations with Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan, and United Arab Emirates. It, it really doesn't need Turkey near as much as it used to. Since the renewal of ties, it has become apparent that Turkey needs Israel much more than it does Turkey. This has been a main argument that I've, I, with little revisions with me, I think in 2019, uh, Israel started making overtures to Turkey, 2000, early 20, but I think they pulled back. And uh, overtures by Turkey also have been diluted by the political instability of multiple elections in Israel. And that's also something time, very timely, that right the moment that Turkey's trying to reach out to Israel, they've had multiple elections. And during this period of time, I don't imagine anything that's going to happen with not just Turkey, with, with the fact that it worked out with the EU, EUA is just because you have a consensus in, in Israel about that. Turkey's outreach with the Palestinians has been greatly affected, yet it's dependent on relations with Israel. We can talk about that later. Um, and that's all. Now the outlook for the future, post-pandemic, more of the same. Turkey might succeed in making progress, which will be overblown in its pro-government press. However hard to imagine will be substantial. We'll wait and see, let's see. Um, deterioration with the US is a continued weight. Deterioration relations with the US is a continued weight on Turkey. It missed golden opportunities to seal deals under Trump. In fact, its attempt to make ground in the US through lobbying has completely failed. It was a complete failure. Now, had they, under the Trump era, really pushed for ties with Israel, really, really pushed up, I'm putting that on top of the agenda, today things will, or even with Egypt, today things would look a lot different, I imagine. They missed that opportunity. And the last thing is Turkey, Turkey's internal state of affairs does not stand as hope for change within the internal international realm. Of course, international relations are not established on freedoms, but rather on stability of governments. So I'm not saying that, you know, if Turkey goes more toward authoritarianism or not, that's not the issue of countries not making, cutting deals with them. It's that lack of, in, you know, it's that lack of instability inside the country, that there really is no standard, you know, the, the AKP over the last 20 years really haven't been able to implement fully their, what they want to happen in the country and transform the country to something different. Rather, we see in the last 10 years, just a very difficult internal situation that really, like I said, radiates outward and makes it much harder to, I would say, seal deals and make agreements with the countries that they, they previously have had um, in stays with recently. So I'll, I'll go ahead and end there, thanks. Um, thank you very much, thank you very much, Louis. Um, and it's, I'm actually, I'm really glad to have a historian on board because historians always give this very broad perspective that we, you know, we sometimes tend to forget about. So um, thank you so much. And now we're moving to uh, Dr. Nasi. So Salim, uh, go ahead. Uh, I, th I think you're still, you're still on mute, Salim. Over a year, and I still couldn't get used to <laughs> using Zoom. Sorry. Uh, it's, uh, I would like to thank to uh, Seftus for inviting us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be sharing this panel with uh, my distinguished colleagues and friends. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to uh, Luis for this uh, summary. Uh, he, his, his presentation is important in terms of understanding the necessity of uh, the shift, a reset in Turkish foreign policy. Uh, but uh, I think my views slightly differ on uh, why, the, when we ask why the situation, what is, why did we arrive at this point today? I and mean, we shouldn't be uh, holding Turkey uh, responsible for everything. Um, so what I will do today, uh, for a change, I'm not going to only focus on turkish israel relations, but try to uh, reflect on um, the course of developments since uh, perhaps last December and uh, try to uh, reflect on what for, uh, the way forward should be. Um, 
as you have all uh, been following closely, for the last couple of months, there has been relative calm in the Eastern Mediterranean. Political tensions have de-escalated considerably. There have been a number of um, mediation efforts initiated by Germany, NATO. As a result of these efforts, uh, Turkey recalled the Oritrees exploration vessel. Uh, Turkey and Greece also have started uh, a new round of exploratory talks after five years. Also, there, have been, uh, there has been an exchange of positive messages between the leaders uh, of Turkey and France. In addition to this, the UN is convening a five plus one meeting in April uh, to discuss prospects for um, resuming talks on Cyprus. When we look at Turkey, Lately, Turkey has adopted a more conciliatory language toward Western countries, including the EU and the US. I can say that Turkey is putting uh, the hard power politics back uh, on the back burner and uh, making uh, opening the way uh, for dialogue and diplomacy. A number of factors have encouraged this shape, sh shift. Above all, uh, I would say it's the economy. The COVID pandemic, um, aggravated, has aggravated Turkey's economic problems. Turkey, as you all know, is not a resource-rich country like Russia or Saudi Arabia. Turkey needs foreign investment. Therefore, the government has recently toned down the inflammatory rhetoric uh, at, uh, abroad and uh, introduced democratic reforms at home to uh, attract foreign investors and win, at least win their trust. Apart from this, Joe Biden's election uh, as US president uh, has certainly affected political calculations uh, in Ankara. The Biden administration favors a stronger coordination with transatlantic allies uh, in tackling foreign policy issues. The EU's decision to postpone uh, economic sanctions on Turkey last December pleased Ankara in a way, but also gave it a cause for concern that it could face uh, a, a, an EU-US bloc uh, in the case that the crisis in the Eastern Mediterranean spills out of control. So Turkey uh, has moderated its stance toward the West. Uh, we also know that it has been uh, pursuing uh, communications with Egypt and Israel to normalize bilateral relations. And the outcome of these negotiations is likely to alter power balances in the region. Perhaps we can expand on this issue in the second round. All these developments I mentioned uh, have helped foster uh, a, a relative period of calm, calm, I would say. But we shouldn't get our hopes up uh, because uh, these measures offer only temporary relief. Any unilateral gesture or inflammatory um, remark could trigger a new round of uh, escalation in the Eastern Mediterranean and further strain Turkey's relations with the West. That is why this window of opportunity should be used effectively to settle conflicts. But how? Uh, the agenda is jam-packed. Uh, and uh, the biggest handicap is, in my point of view, uh, to devise the right approach. Is it, uh, is it better for us to uh, address these issues as a package and uh, try to um, seek a grand bargain? Or should we try to deal each of them uh, separately, like one step at a time? Another point of concern is uh, very much related to the issue of um, political will and enforcement capacity. Um, which brings us to another question, which states or uh, institutions can best play the role of an honest broker to settle disputes? With regard to the right approach, um, honestly, I cannot decide. Take, for instance, the Cyprus issue, which lies in the, at the heart of uh, the Eastern Mediterranean crisis and which is also a serious bone of contention between Turkey and the EU. The settlement of the Cyprus issue would certainly contribute to peace and security in the region. And needless to say, uh, a solution on the island uh, would reinvigorate Turkey's EU membership process. But so far, we have tried, uh, we have explored every possible avenue to reach a settlement and we and then, uh, have failed uh, each time. I doubt that we will reach, uh, we will see a different outcome this time, especially when Turkey is seeking a two-state solution. We have discussed these issues several times in the past. I don't want to you know, repeat uh, again and again, but um, 
it was a mistake to uh, let Cyprus join the EU without uh, reaching a settlement before reaching a settlement to the Cyprus issue. Greek Cypriots today are very content with the status quo. They don't need to, they have every, they've got everything they need, so they, there is no need for them to compromise. Uh, that is, at, uh, at least until recently, that is the case, as Greece and Egypt are uh, considering changing the route of the uh, East Med gas pipeline to bypass Cyprus. By the way, uh, the Greek media uh, later on uh, reported that the two countries actually reconciled their differences, but the Egyptians remain silent on the issue, as far as I know. If that is the case, then the reality is perhaps sinking in, and uh, Greek Cypriots that excluding Turkey from energy projects uh, was not a, was not such a smart uh, strategy after all. Uh, recently, also Israel and Egypt agreed to link Israel's Leviathan gas reserve to um, Egypt's LNG terminals via a subsea uh, pipeline uh, and export Israeli gas uh, to world markets from there. That's another indicator for me that even members of the East Mat Gas Forum have reservations about the feasibility of the project, uh, technically, uh, politically and economically profit-wise, uh, that is why, which is why they are seeking alternatives. Uh, Turkey's recent uh, pursuit of a hardline assertive policy, which uh, Louise touched upon, uh, has been criticized at home and abroad. I am one of those who think Turkey should make room for a more constructive diplomacy because inflammatory rhetoric uh, from policymakers may help mobilize masses uh, back home, but uh, it undermines diplomatic efforts to explain Turkey's rightful cause to the rest of the world. So it is self-destructive in a way. Uh, however, against all risks, when I look at Turkey's game of brinkmanship, it seems to have paid off, at least partially, uh, in disrupting the economic projects in the Eastern Mediterranean and forcing international actors to finally actually work toward a settlement toward uh, a settlement to frozen conflicts like Cyprus. Uh, so perhaps Europeans should also look in the mirror. Uh, if they weren't so preoccupied with their internal problems, and if they were able to devise a, a far-sighted and perhaps a coherent policy toward Turkey, we wouldn't be in this situation today, referring to Louise's chart. <laughs> I, I would like to quote Ambassador Shafak Göktürk, uh, who eloquently noted in an essay uh, published in uh, Duar English last week, uh, the EU cannot be blamed for Turkey's own poor performance with regard to implementation of the reforms. However, uh, Brussels could have acted as an involved and credible partner, end quote. Uh, it is important because especially the negotiation of the chapters on uh, judiciary and fundamental rights, chapter 23 and chapter 24, which is on justice, freedom and security, which were both vetoed by Cyprus, could have helped Turkey improve its performance in the areas of fundamental rights and the rule of law. What we have today is uh, an installed uh, accession process. The EU-Turkey ties uh, have long been in a coma. And neither side uh, holds out much hope uh, that the patient is going to uh, get better, recover. They're just looking to make sure that they don't lose the patient on the operating table. Uh, so uh, the EU doesn't look at Turkey as a candidate country anymore, but sees it as a, as a neighbor. Uh, and Turkey moves so uh, far away from fulfilling accession criteria that the EU doesn't even bother including criticisms in the reports anymore. The only reason the accession process hasn't been suspended uh, is uh, to, proceed, to prevent ties from really uh, flying off the rails. Uh, so there is mutual trust, uh, mutual distrust. And over the years, the EU uh, has also lost its charm as a union. That's another subject to debate. But worse, uh, it has lost its political leverage uh, to get Turkey back on the democracy track. And this whole transactional approach thing, which only sugarcoats uh, pragmatism, is not helping uh, at all in the sense. The only tool uh, the e left for the EU is economic sanctions, and imposing them would hurt both sides. And let's not forget that Turkey still holds the refugee card. So even though prospects are slim, a, a reset in Turkey's relations with the EU is necessary because 
A well-functioning Turkey-EU relationship is essential not only to solve the long-standing problems, disputes but in the Mediterranean, but also prevent future crises in the Mediterranean and thereby maintain the security of, the, of NATO's southern flank. So at, the, at, at, at some point, we will uh, start discussing this uh, deeply. So going back to the question of who might play a constructive role in solving the problems, it's probably not the EU. Uh, who would have a tough time being the honest broker, because two of the countries involved in the Eastern Mediterranean and Aegean disputes, Greece and Cyprus, are also EU members. And then there is France, whose interests in the Eastern Mediterranean and Africa clash with Turkey's and which supports the anti-Turkey bloc in the EU. Uh, add to that the membership solidarity and the upcoming elections in Germany and France, it is difficult for the EU to be impartial. Uh, and besides all this, the EU has another dilemma. Because Turkey has distanced itself uh, value-wise from the EU, the bloc doesn't want to reward, uh, to do anything to reward Turkey, uh, so long as the Erdogan government change, uh, doesn't change direction. That's because um, European governments themselves are also fighting uh, nationalism and far-right politics uh, at home, and they are worried about losing power. Um, but they acknowledge the fact that any moves against Turkey, which already feels betrayed by the EU uh, on, uh, on Cyprus, will push it further away, uh, perhaps leading it to take risky maneuvers uh, with political considerations in mind. Thus, in terms of political will and enforcement capacity, I would say the US and in the main NATO uh, could take on a more constructive role. Indeed, when NATO stepped in, Turkey and Greece agreed to uh, establish a deconflicting mechanism. And compared to the EU, the United States has greater leverage on Turkey. President Biden and his team uh, know these problems inside out. Of course, this doesn't, um, uh, we cannot take granted that the solutions would be in Turkey's interest. And this is not a guarantee. Uh, Britain, which is also one of the guarantor countries in Cyprus and a member of the UN Security Council, is also interested in uh, brokering a solution. However, the UK's recent proposal uh, about Cyprus did not pos uh, receive positive feedback from the Turkish Cypriots, which is not surprising. Maybe we can come to that later on and discuss uh, the content of the proposal. Um, but a solution to the Cyprus issue, as I said, would certainly contribute to peace and security in the Eastern Mediterranean and, and help reinvigorate Turkey-EU relations. But perhaps starting with the Cyprus issue might be like putting the cart before the horse, unless we are ready to embrace some out-of-the-box solutions and perhaps uh, think about the box itself as well. Um, because diplomatic failure leads to political fatigue and that feeds frustration. Meanwhile, the buildup of new disputes on top of uh, the pre-existing conflicts makes solution even more difficult. Um, I sound very pessimistic, I know I'm wrapping up. Uh, the mood to give, uh, at the end of the day, the mood to give dialogue a chance is a positive development. At least it re reduces the risk uh, of a military confrontation, perhaps we need to learn to live with contradictions and uncertainties because there aren't any quick fixes to these uh, complex problems. Therefore, diplomacy perhaps in this period focuses more on preventing uh, the, the, the outbreak of hot conflicts instead of actually solving the problems. But uh, it's about playing time, playing for time uh, in order to ensure permanent stability in the region. The sides need to roll up their sleeves on the frozen conflicts so they cannot run away forever. So perhaps this all means to me that 2020 might be a year of tough decisions. We'll see. Okay, I will leave it here. Excellent. Thank you very much, Celine. D did I exceed my time? Sorry about that. If Not I... by much. It's absolutely uh, okay. It, it, it's it's uh, we, we manage. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Linden Strauss. So, uh, Galia, when you're ready. Thank you. So I would also like to join uh, thanks to Seftus for organizing this event and for my two colleagues for giving you such uh, knowledgeable presentations that definitely make my work easier, so thank you. Um, now, when we look at the, what happened in the Eastern Mediterranean in the past two decades, uh, the two actors that I would argue played a decisive and uh, decisive role 
are uh, the Republic of Cyprus and Turkey. Now in Turkey, we talk a lot, but even in Cyprus, we talk less. I'm glad Celine did talk about Cyprus, but usually we talk a little bit less, as, an, as, as also as an agent itself, uh, not just as, as a passive actor, but as an agent itself in developments. And I think the Republic of Cyprus uh, showed the creative and active diplomacy. Uh, it's a small state, uh, but it did use all its measures to really have uh, influence. And I think this active diplomacy came to play with the signing of the different uh, exclusive economic zone agreements. Uh, first it did with Egypt in 2003, then it did with Lebanon in 2007, and then it was, did with Israel in 2010. And in this way, these easy agreements uh, were a catalyst for much that happened later. Mm. And of course, also the fact that the Cyprus problem has not been solved and here the, the, the famous uh, fact that the 2004 Anand plan did not pass in the referendum uh, among the Cypriot, uh, the Greek Cypriots was also, of course, uh, to a large extent, one of the explanations of why we have so much tension uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean today. Now, the other actor, the very uh, active actor we, we, that we usually talk about is Turkey. And of course, already starting actually from the flotilla incident in 2010, which really pushed Israel, Greece, and, and Cyprus together. Uh, but later on, with the sending of the research and drilling ships uh, to what Cyprus and Greece considered their uh, exclusive economic zone, to the famous uh, 2019 Turkish uh, exclusive economic zone agreement with the government of national accord in Libya. Now, whatever you think about this agreement, uh, it was actually an example of thinking outside the box. It definitely surprised uh, the regional actors and it had, a, it had a major effect. Now, all this creativity I'm talking about does not necessarily bring good results to these actors. Uh, the fact that Turkey is now talking about a two-state solution to Cyprus is definitely a problem in the eyes of the Greek Cypriots. And also Turkey, the fact that it's, uh, that it's uh, some of Turkish officials are, have already been sanctioned by the EU and the EU is perhaps considering more sanctions of the EU. Uh, uh, the EU is considering more sanctions of Turkey is of course uh, very problematic. Now, while both of these actors, Turkey and Cyprus were the catalysts, uh, they're of course not the only major actors in the Eastern Mediterranean. And of course we have Israel and we have, we have Greece and we have uh, Egypt. And since I'm based in Tel Aviv, I will give you the Israeli view. Uh, it took Israel some time to understand the Turkish change of policy toward it and that it would become a lasting feature. Uh, but the loss of Turkey created also some immediate problems and hence alternatives were found. Uh, for example, the Israel Air Force used to uh, train in Turkey, in Turkish airspace. But once that had stopped, the Israeli Air Force had to find somewhere else to train because Israel is very small. Uh, and the fact that, that Greece opened its air bases uh, for Israeli jets was very useful. And what was at first perhaps uh, more temporary alternatives have become robust and more permanent features. Uh, more generally, Israel discovered its Western border. It discovered the Mediterranean. Uh, if you add to the rift, uh, uh, with Turkey, the gas discovery, the fact that Israel has major uh, desalination plants uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, 80% of Israel's water, uh, drinking water, comes from desalination. Uh, climate change related extreme weather events, you can understand that Israel will continue its policy uh, to develop deep and fruitful relations with many, as many East Med partners as it can. Uh, a more recent development, which we should pay attention, and actually Louis uh, talked about it earlier, are the growing linkages between the security structures in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East security structures. Uh, the Abram Accords are very important in this respect. Uh, these linkages have enhanced cooperation on the one hand, and you see, for example, growing relations between the Hellenic states and the Arab Gulf states, but they've also created complications. Uh, for example, we had the, uh, the East Med Gas Forum Energy Minister's meeting the other day. And one of the items on the agenda was to approve the UAAE status as an observer in the organizations. But the Palestinians vetoed it because of their criticisms of the fact that the UAE signed the Abraham Accords. Now, as we know, Middle East politics can have a paralyzing effect in international organizations. And hence, I would conclude that every effort should be made to make sure that we don't get to this point in the Eastern Mediterranean, 
And I will return to the water Louis talked about and in general, uh, the environmental issues. I think that's a way forward. I think this is a threat to all these countries and is something that is seen as less political and as a way forward. And I think another aspect is the post-COVID-19 uh, economies, and especially the fact that all these countries are very much uh, dependent on tourism. How, what are the alternatives to this dependency, or can you find solutions to encourage uh, tourism? Uh, I think this is also an area that perhaps in the Eastern Mediterranean, at least these countries can think about uh, in a constructive manner. And I'm looking forward to the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gaia. And I think we can move to the end. We've already, uh, we already have quite a few questions in the, um, in the chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, uh, I'll try to summarize these questions and address, I, I think all of you can actually see them as well in the chat. I'm going to try and summarize this question and address them to the um, to the speaker. So uh, we have a fir our first question from um, Ismail uh, and Ismail asks Louis. Uh, and, and again, please, uh, I'm going to try and, and if 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 you feel that I misrepresented your question, let me know. But I'll try to summarize them. Um, so, um, Louis, what do you think? I mean, what is uh, in in a world that is becoming more multipolar? Uh, where is where is Turkey's, um, where is Turkey's place in such a new order? Um, and I would, um, and I would add to that, where is um, Israel's position in this in this new order, in which China is becoming a more and more influential actor in the region? Uh, uh, thanks for the question. Um, one second, I'm just coming out of focus. I'm gonna do that again. Very good. Yes. Um, so in, with China, I think. I would be walking on uh, uh, ice if, if I go too far into it. But uh, generally speaking, I think the dynamics, see the dynamics of Turkey is very interesting. Um, I, I, I think I was surprised at how far they've been moving towards um, strengthening their ties with Russia and the S, S400. I think that, that, that took me off. You know, I mean, it was just two years ago, or three, maybe it was two or three years ago. And the Russian ambassador was was assassinated in in Ankara, and there was a plane that was shot down. So, so understanding that a lot of this has to do with suspicion towards the United States, different things behind the the coup, and that Russia actually was one of the first countries to, to warn Turkey that a, a coup was under in in the process. Um, you know, I wrote an article right after the the failed coup, and and I said that why we'll never know really what happened that night. And I can, uh, I can explain that. Uh, so putting that aside, but if we, if we take the official narrative. So I, I, I think what's interesting is that Russia didn't renew non-visa travel for Turkish people that they had before that. Um, and I thought that, that was interesting. Now looking at China, yes, it, it, it's fascinating to see how, uh, especially with the condition of the Uyghurs and human rights against it, that Turkey has been willing to really uh, go 180 degree turn and, and try to, to focus on strengthening ties with China, which, which I think makes complete sense if you look at the international relation, international relations aspects. Of course, I said international relations do not usually look at human rights issues um, at its core. Um, and in this case, it was actually very many people pro Erdogan groups that were, were the most anti-China, the anti-China uh, camp. So it, that that's been interesting. Now with 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 Israel, I think is if you look at the in you know how Israel's diversified its foreign relations, I think it really has been able to have its cake and eat it too, in that sense that um, it's continued its strong relations with um, with the U.S. and at the same time having you know pretty um, solid and stable relations with with Russia that that. Politics are different, but still we see that you know um, Israel often uh, strike have have airstrikes against you know the Syrian government and the Russian relations really that's within the parameters of that. So um, and I would argue also that Israel's diversifying to China has also been very very important. I think I'll I'll end up in by saying here, and I think the the revolution that I, I would. What, what Netanyahu brought to Israel is something that Erdogan hasn't been able to bring to Turkey though. And that's using these relations 
to really strengthen the economy at the heart and to create, an, a, a, I would argue, a new society where Israelis, despite the continued occupation, they have um, the, the, con the conflict is a very low maintenance conflict. So for Palestinians, it remains very high maintenance. But Israel has created this situation where at least until now, during the, during the Netanyahu years, and I'm, I actually was trying to use the word Netanyahuism, but that really is, you know, you know, bringing in that's that's the neo neo economics, the economics of 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 of, of, of building and 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 construction that Turkey had in 2010. That they were saying that Turkey in 2009 and 10 was headed in that direction. I think bringing lots of foreign money into the into the country and having that produce a very very strong economy. Problem is that this this, this um over Turkey overheated and, and due to the internal politics, it completely um, it was brought to a halt. And today we see that. Let me end by saying that the airport, the Istanbul airport, still a surprisingly, um, you know, there is still hope that that's going to be when the, the, the major hub. And I think what Galia, what you talked about, tourism is so important. It, it's so important for, for Israel that it has had tourism closed throughout this pandemic. Um, which is which is quite remarkable that remarkable that only tourists can no tourists have gone to Israel for over a year now for exactly a year where Tur Turkey has kept tourism open um, having to keep it open um, because they, they, I think they're so dependent on that on that cash so I hope there's some sense to make what I said um, but but I'll leave it at that thank you very much Louis. And we have another question by Ismail, this time to Celine. So Celine, what do you think is the connection between the 2006 coup and, and Turkey's change of foreign policy? You're still on mute. There is a connection, I can say it's very relevant because the rising popularity of the Blue Homeland Doctrine is connected to the transformation of Turkish foreign policy uh, in the last two decades. And this shift is, has been driven by both systemic uh, and domestic developments. Like other actors, Turkey has moved uh, to fill in the power vacuum in the region. Uh, Turkish policymakers uh, benefited from the changing security landscape and exploited uh, the opportunities to carve out a greater strategic autonomy uh, for the country to uh, and with the aim of uh, becoming a regional power. Uh, however, Turkey's hard power um, fell short of forcing a settlement uh, to disputes, but uh, achieved also limited results, changing balances on the ground. But from a financial perspective, I would say it is not sustainable uh, in the long term. Moreover, because it has neglected diplomacy, uh, Turkey has found itself um, more isolated uh, regionally. That is why now Ankara is trying to recalibrate its relations with regional actors, not only the US, uh, the EU, but also Israel, uh, Egypt, uh, and uh, the Gulf countries, including Saudi Arabia as well. So. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we have another question to Celine, this time by Cengiz Gunesh. Mm -hmm. And Cengiz, and, and um, if I, you know, I think the essence of the question is, um, Turkey is often claimed to, uh, to become more democratic, either for the sake of joining the EU or to attract foreign direct investment. Uh, but but Cengiz just suggested, you know, uh, most of Turkey's recent actions do not really indicate a commitment to democracy. And especially the uh, especially its its policies toward the uh, the head of it. So what what do you, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say uh, we have a credibility problem. Surely, uh, but there is a contradiction between what between what is being said and what is being done. Uh, especially referring to the uh, recent uh, report, the recent uh, human rights report reforms. Uh, I would say, uh, for the, as of now, the, the, the European Union, Europeans are uh, content uh, that at least Turkey is making uh, an effort to, you know, even if it may look cosmetic uh, as of now, but they will, uh, they are reviewing it, the file is under review, 
and they prefer to wait and see uh, and look at the implement Turkey's implementation. If, for instance, Turkey takes another step, decides to close uh, uh, the HDP, then of course uh, this will undermine Turkey's uh, reform uh, efforts, and and. Um, and of course, send a, a negative message to foreign investors. I mean, at least uh, this will be, uh, you know, a U-turn from the uh, from a democratic uh, reform process. Um, I, I see the point here. I mean, I, I, I it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be. Uh, I hope we won't come to that point because it it is going to be also bad for the uh, pluralism and uh, you know uh, freedom of expression uh, and. It will be detrimental to Turkey's democratic future. Um, thank you very much. And um, we have a question by Hassan Malik. And I think that this question, I, I think um, the, the three of you can, can maybe uh, answer this question. But what what um, specific measures can be taken to improve Turkey relations? What, what is, it? is it again to me? No, no, I, th I think the question oh. is. To everyone, but um, uh, Gaia, because because you actually spoke about uh, you, you know you discussed the, the subject from an Israeli perspective, so maybe you can elaborate on that. I apologize, I didn't hear the question. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. So the question is, what specific measures can be taken to improve Israel-Turkey relations? And oh. some suggest maybe instead of state-to-state -state relations, it might be um, you know non-state actors could be better partners in this respect. Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, actually, just uh, other, uh, just uh, yesterday, Netanyahu uh, uh, spoke in a, one of an uh, election rally, and he said, uh, and he was asked about uh, the gas issue, and he said, actually, we're also talking with Turkey, and it's a good thing. And this comes after Erdogan saying that a few few months ago, Erdogan saying that uh, maybe we should uh, repair relations with Israel. Uh, so there is something uh, cooking in this, as, uh, as mentioned before, uh, one of the ways uh, Turkey is trying to deal with its isolation is trying to approach, uh, first of all, uh, mo mo the most successful approach, I think, is to Saudi Arabia, but it's also trying to approach uh, Israel and, uh, and, um, and Egypt. Uh, as Louis said, uh, Israel is not in the hurry, in a hurry to repair its relations uh, with uh, Turkey. It, 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 it does mark a change, as Louis said. In the past, it was more like the feeling was more that Israel needs Turkey more than Turkey needs Israel, and now uh, Israel is not in a rush to uh, to to improve relations with Turkey. Part of the problem is also this, uh, this election cycle we're stuck in. And this is the fourth election uh, we're we're kind of. And uh, Louis talked about even a fifth election. That's part of the problem. Uh, another problem is, I think, uh, now Israel wants to see that Turkey is sincere about its wish to improve relations with Israel. That it's not just spoiling its uh, Israel's relations with uh, its Hellenic partners and with with Egypt uh, and this, this square. Um, so Israel has sort of some of some conditions. One is stopping uh, Hamas military activity in Turkish soil. That's something that has been a big if you have a um, concern for Israel, and Israel feels that Turkey can do more to stop uh, Hamas from orchestrating some of its, of its military activities through Turkey. Uh, another issue is the involvement of Turkey in uh, East Jerusalem and among Israeli Arabs. Israel wants more, uh, more transparency. And the third issue is uh, Erdogan's rhetoric, harsh rhetoric uh, towards Israel, uh, which he's known to, <laughs> to do for, uh, for many years. Uh, he's actually been right, rather silent on Israel, but even when he said uh, Turkey should improve relations with Israel, he said that Israel should also act um, um, in a different manner towards the Palestinians. So it's very, it's very hard for him not to criticize Israel. And that's the that's third sort of uh, condition. Uh, I would say the mistrust between the sides is great, uh, but I would not exclude the possibilities that the ambassadors would be back uh, to Tel Aviv and Ankara. I think that's definitely... Uh, something that is, is, is a plausible scenario. Thank you. My views very much concur with uh, Dalia's. Uh, I would like to uh, say a few things on that. Uh, exchange of envoys would be the first step in normalization of bilateral ties, but we, we need time for uh, a real normalization to take place and rebuild trust because uh, trust eroded 
a lot over the years. And the more we prolong this impasse between the two countries, the worse it gets. And uh, I see a potential, uh, particularly after the elections, Israeli elections, maybe we can see the two countries moving towards each other, making, making a step towards each other. And this would uh, ameliorate uh, and reduce attention in the uh, region at least and contribute uh, to the regional stability, I believe. But we'll see, of course. Thank you. Um, Louis, Louis would, you, would you be interested also in answering the question? Yeah, just, just, just two, uh, two or three things. I, I agree with, with everything that's been, been said here. I think what, what, what I often point out is that if Turkey really does want to make the lives of Palestinians better, it would go, that is through Israel. That is through strong relations through Israel. And I think that's something key. Let's say there's no doubt that Turkey has made a very important stamp in the change of uh, different, um, I think even in the daily lives, if you look at some of the projects uh, in Gaza, I believe a hospital, other things, um, it really has done some really constructive work and it, and it goes beyond just rhetoric. I mean, Turkey is, um, you know, Turkey has that historical, if you look at the history, but that historical responsibility of it being, a, you know, the former Ottoman Empire. And I think a, a, it's a, a special sensitive tie towards Palestine. However, I would say that when it does, you know, ramp up the rhetoric against Israel and as relations get worse, that doesn't help the Palestinians at all. In fact, because remember, it's very interesting that Erdogan, not like the Arab countries that it had in the past, has never called to boycott going to Israel. In fact, he encourages um, his followers to go to Jerusalem and be part of that. And that's something that Israel's used to their benefit. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, and and I would hope that also in the in the post UAE relations that Turkish Air continues its very strong presence in the Tel Aviv Istanbul line that 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 sort of it created some normalcy over the years that no matter what happens that plane comes and it was the second number second carrier in the world uh, after El Al of carrying Israelis back and forth and tourists back and forth so I think these, these connected tourism. So I think there are, there are ways to, as uh, um, both Selin and Galia highlighted, to, to construct these relations. My argument is that with good relations, that's also um, good um, for Palestinians. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, really, uh, their Palestinians are isolated more than ever because of the agreement with the UAE and the other agreements. So, so you know, it'll be interesting to see if they are going to adopt the Turkish model where civil groups in their, those countries will pressure and continue to try to, you know, bring an end somehow to the occupation, although I don't think it's anywhere close right now. But, but I think, so Turkey does have a role to play here um, and it can be very positive, but for that to happen, relations really have to, have to get better. And that's the irony, I would say. Um, thank you very much. And we have a really interesting question that I would like to um, I would like to put forward, and this is a question by uh, Jonathan Bloom. To um, and, and again, it's to all of the uh, speakers. Um, and even though Iran is not based in the Eastern Mediterranean, it has had a growing influence. Um, and, and and Jonathan asked, what what impact do you think that the tensions uh, from from Iran will have will have on the region? So, what role would Iran actually play? In, in post pandemic regional geopolitics. Um, Galia, would you like to start? Yes, I'll just say something. I think, uh, of course, Iran is involved in the region and it has relations both with Hezbollah and with Hamas, and this also goes through, through sea. But what's interesting about the East Mediterranean, and here maybe um, it's clear why the East Mediterranean is in a region in itself is that the, the Libyan conflict, for example, which is central for the developments in the Eastern Mediterranean, there, Iran doesn't have a role. The conflict there is between Turkey on the one side and uh, the UAE uh, slash Russia slash um, France um, supported uh, forces. Um, and here again, Iran is not there, and, but Libya has become really a focal point of developments in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so that's why I think, <laughs> in contrast to when I, I participated in Middle East panels, Iran has not come up till now, and that's, I think that's notable. Okay, 
thank you, Dalia. Um, um, Selim, would you like, do, do you have any, any comment about Iran's role in? Uh, I just missed, let me check. It has never gone a lot of attentions. Well, uh, Iran, uh, Iran's uh, increasing uh, power in the region has been an element uh, which pushed uh, Turkey and Israel to cooperate in the past. And containment of Iran still provides an important uh, issue that they can that these two countries can cooperate. Interestingly, uh, we know that after the coup attempt, uh, Turkey moved closer to Iran within the Astana peace process. However, Iran is very critical about uh, Turkish uh, military presence in Syria, and uh, it, it, it never uh, shied away from criticizing uh, and uh, pointing out that Turkish uh, military uh, forces should leave uh, Syrian uh, ground. And um, after the Azerbaijan uh, crisis I mean, uh, between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, um, we once again saw that uh, relations are getting tenser between uh, Turkey and Iran. And this, uh, to some experts, uh, they see an opportunity uh, for Turkey and Israel to develop closer ties uh, over the Iranian threat. Um, I always say this, um, in Turkey, uh, there is a limit that Turkey can uh, confront Iran. I mean, uh, Turkey would avoid uh, a direct confrontation with Iran because they are sharing a border. But I think in the future, we are going to see uh, that these two countries would be uh, moving uh, perhaps uh, a, a more distanced uh, and um, relations may uh, have bumps uh, in the future. I mean, ups and downs in the future, but we'll see. Uh, we need to uh, see how the uh, uh, events will unfold in the region. Because if Turkey wants to recalibrate its relations with the West and be a part of this pro-Western uh, axis, it's going to be a, a, a difficult balance, uh, difficult to manage that balance uh, between relations with Iran and be a part of this pro-Western uh, axis in the uh, region. I mean, when region, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, and that stretches to the, to the Middle East, to the Gulf. Thank you, Selim. Uh, Louis? Yeah, just uh, a few words. This really is not not my, my expertise, but I would say that you know it's interesting. I think that that you know I think Turkey and Iran continue sort of a, a status quo, you know, the, uh, sharing a border and 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 keeping um, keeping things polite. And you know, every few years you hear, oh, Turkey's coming very close to Iran. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't see that happen. I don't see that they're you know going to see be uh, what to challenge Iran as a as a major adversary, anyways. We look at we look at Syria, for example, and you know, is you know, propping up Assad, and and then you know, it's sort of that like what happened in, in Syria. There's that you know, what happens in Syria happens in Syria, but doesn't have to really reflect our relations with that country in terms of our own bilateral relations. I'm glad you brought up um, Azerbaijan selling in this because I think it was really important. We saw um, exactly what Gaia had mentioned about the, the you know the the airspace. Um, and Israel, you know, when, when they were, when they had their fighter jets, they were refabricating, uh, refurbishing their tanks and Israel was with Turkey. Um, and, and Israel found a, another arm, someone that's interested in arms. I mean, it's terrible for, for, I think, the image of Israel that they all are, you know, dealing in arms at such a, at, at, at this level. But for, it, it moved, Israel moved towards Azerbaijan. And I think that that support of Azerbaijan by Israel really um, propped up at the same time the overtures of Turkey towards Israel. They, they sort of got well. Israel's helping out Azerbaijan, and 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 why you know, and a lot of Turkish people, if you look at Twitter, were saying, "Look what you know, look how they're saving the you know Azerbaijan in this war, you know, drones and different things like this." Um, and there's sort of this you know this this, this huge immense. Uh, amount of, of pride, so I think that's that that also brings you know that that, that picture of, of Israel and Azerbaijan is really really interesting and in how it, how it's uh, how it's been playing out as well. Uh, let me end by saying also interesting enough that the, uh, many of the Palestinian groups were su supporting Armenia. That long mm -hmm. history historical connection between Palestinians and Armenians, and it was mm -hmm. really interesting to see the the, the side switch. That that it was it was a very strong voice among Palestinians, 
to support uh, Armenian feminists. And I think that was a very interesting dynamic as well. Um, th yeah, th thank you for the last note. I think I, it. it um, uh, I see. I see a question on Cyprus. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So there's a question by um, I am Anthony Deisiotis, and and again, I'm sorry. I know that some of you have brought up um, questions, but I want to make sure that everyone in the audience is is able to ask at least one question. So, so um, um, uh, Anthony is being very pessimistic about the future solution for Cyprus. Uh, what what do you think about it, Anthony? I am. I, I, I totally share his views. I'm pessimistic too, unfortunately. Uh, maybe it is time to uh, bring up uh, the, the UK's proposal uh, because you know uh, it. it uh, we had negative reactions from the Turkish uh, Cypriots uh, on that. Uh, reportedly, a verbal presentation was made during the a meeting between the TRNC's uh, President Arsen Tatar and the. Uh, and the UK Secretary of State for uh, Foreign Affairs, Dominic Raab. The proposal uh, identifies the constituent uh, entities as communal states, um, embracing um, a constructive ambiguity here. The UK probably is trying to find a middle way, uh, middle ground between a federal solution and the confederation of two sovereign states that Turkey now uh, advocates. But it is not clear what these two entities uh, are entitled to uh, in terms of uh, exercising their sovereignty. More importantly, the devil is in the details. Uh, this um, proposal um, calls for a rapid uh, calls for Turkey's uh, rapid withdrawal of uh, military forces from the island immediately after the deal and uh, termination of uh, Turkey's guarantor status, uh, along with abrogation of its unilateral uh, intervention in 10 years time. So uh, 10 years after the agreement enters into force. So I don't think uh, either the Turks or Turkish Cypriots would agree to that. And uh, of course, Turkey's uh, advocating two-state solution uh, would certainly be opposed by the EU, <laughs> the three guarantor, the two of the guarantor states and, and the UN Security Council members. So uh, including the, uh, and I was, uh, yeah, so, um, it's 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 a deadlock. Mm. Um, thank you, and we have we have another um, question by Ismail, and um, um, Ismail asks whether um, the um, operations or the collaboration, um, the Israeli U.S. you know um, France and Greece collaboration aims not just to uh, contain Turkey, but also China, Russia, and Iran. What do you think? Are we, are we witnessing a broader move on the side of the US and Israel? Um, Kalia, would you, would you like perhaps to answer this question? I think part of the dynamics in recent years, both in the Middle East, but also in the East Mediterranean, arise from this perception that the US is going to withdraw from the region and uh, pivot to Asia. That, uh, mm. that different president, US presidents have tried, but yet have to succeed. Um, and in this respect, uh, I think this is less of a, uh, a great power competition necessarily uh, that is taking place, but rather the, the vacuum that creates problems and then you need the great powers to solve the problems. That's where it, it enters. So I don't think so. it's so much about containing. I mm -hmm. think it's more about uh, maintaining the stability. Thank you very much, Gaia. Uh, Louis, would you would you like to answer this question as well? Yeah, I'll just say talk about it a bit. I'm um, actually um, using what, some things that Gaia said just now. I think it's really important to to understand that the the lack of the role in America America has played um, over the last you know it started during the Obama years has been detrimental to to, to the region I would say, and that that starts off uh, first and foremost the Palestinian Israeli conflict. Um, that has been totally, I mean, this idea of, we talked about, not, I, I talked before about Netanyahu, Netanyahuism and this um, the neoliberal markets in Israel and, and, and pouring in a, you know, a, 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 let's just say investment. And I mean, Israel's really changed in my opinion in the last 12 years. I, I, I look at every time I go to Tel Aviv, I bring a group there and I say, look at the skyscraper, how many people, how many buildings are being built all the time. It really mirrors Turkey in 2009, 10, 11, and 12. So a mass amount of money is coming in, but on the other hand, there really has been no um, push to make peace 
or to bring the Palestinians to the table. So I think that is just one example. We can look at the Syrian civil war, also the very um, terrible outcome of the Syrian civil war. So this idea that America has pulled out, I think it's quite worrying. And I think to Turkey also um, regionally that, that there's the chance that Biden is going to sort of adopt the Obama plan of, of sort of hands off and that whatever happens, happens. And in that sense, Trump, uh, ironically, uh, I don't know if I, it's ironic in my part, I say ironically, um, you know, uh, allowed uh, to, changes to happen, irreversible changes, I think, with, with UA and, and, these, and these other countries sometimes pressuring them, that really, really transformed uh, the whole political scene um, in, in the region. Um, so perhaps a lot of what we're seeing in the Eastern Mediterranean is happening because of the lack of American influence, right? Um, that's created new tensions, but also has created new realities that, that are, are really transforming the region in terms of economics, which doesn't fare well for, for, for the situation in Cyprus or Palestine and Israel and, and, and other, there's other cases as well. Thank you, Louis. Celine, would you also like to answer this question? I'll, I think I'll pass on that because mm -hmm. I was I saw another uh, question addressed to me posed to me, which is on uh, human rights and uh, we recently as the uh, Ankara Policy Center organized an event on human rights and diplomacy uh, and three uh, distinguished uh, uh, veteran uh, ambassadors. Uh, talked on this on that panel, and uh, I was looking uh, for the uh, right quote because I, I find it I find I find it very meaningful and very relevant to this question. Uh, I, of course, uh, human rights issue is sometimes used as a weapon uh, in the international relations. But um, that uh, during that panel, uh, Ambassador uh, Oz Demiral said. Uh, if you don't have any weaknesses or if you don't have any mistakes, then your enemies won't be able to, or others, not, let's not say uh, enemies, uh, but uh, other states won't be using it against you or exploit your uh, weaknesses if you don't, if, you, if you're, you know, uh, in full integrity and you don't have any uh, gaps or, you know, uh, weak points. So you, we should work on improving our arguments and uh, our own uh, record uh, of uh, foreign policy track, perhaps, uh, in order to, uh, you know, uh, avoid uh, such criticisms and others using and prevent others using uh, these uh, issues against us. But again, if, if I can follow up on this question, I mean, I, I think yeah. it's a very important question, but I mean, it, it goes it goes back to the original question, is Turkey genuinely is the Turkish government genuinely committed to actually thinking its human rights policies? And again, particularly the policies toward the crypto. Well, it is, uh, yes, of course, you have a point and I agree with that, but uh, it is all related to uh, the, the shift uh, in Turkish foreign policy. For quite a long time, our foreign policy has been pursued on the basis of keeping the government in power. If that changes, uh, because that is very much related to the future of uh, inter-alliances uh, among the parties. We have been uh, ruled by a nationalist uh, coalition, you know. Uh, if that changes, and if really our pol foreign policy uh, is going to be uh, devised, formulated uh, on, uh, based on national interest uh, with a long-term objective, a long-term strategic vision, that has to include a democratic um, identity for Turkey. Uh, and, and that will bring along changes uh, in domestic uh, politics and as well as in Turkish foreign policy. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question by Ihsan uh, Malik. And Ihsan asks, what is the significance of Lebanon and Syria not joining the Eastman gas forum? Could this lead to a creation of a competing of a competing gas form, um, including the you know the um, the TRNC in Lebanon and chaired by by Turkey with with Syria and Russia joining. I'm happy to answer this question. Thank uh, you, Alia. On the one hand, the East Mediterranean gas form was really a remarkable development in the sense that it was 
usually uh, outside actors impose things on the actors in the region and they impose these organizations on the regional actors. But this time it was organic. It's something that came out of the region and uh, has a lot of uh, good elements about it. The bad element is, of course, that while well, theoretically it's open to all, uh, the caveat is that as long as they uh, uh, adhere to the law of the sea, and of course, uh, Turkey uh, is not a signatory state to UNCLOS. This one is neither is also not a uh, signatory, but does uh, does follow the rules. And um, Turkey, by the way, follows the rules in the Black Sea. And basically, some people say it's already become customary law, uh, so you should follow it anyhow. But uh, but as I said, because uh, Turkey um, has not signed UNCLOS, basically, Turkey is out, and also it's true that Lebanon has uh, not joined. Syria is less of an issue because it's so much in the Syrian civil war. Uh, all the, the, the tragedy and all the dysfunction that is resulting from the Syrian civil war, so it's less of an issue. But Lebanon, it, it is an issue because Lebanon also wants to explore its gas, uh, so that's that's a bigger issue. There was attempts to there's a, there is a dispute between uh, Lebanon and Israel on some of the demarcation of the uh, maritime zone between them. Uh, that's by the way one of the reasons why Lebanon, uh, while signing an agreement with Greece, uh, sorry, so it's signing an agreement with Cyprus and the EZ has not ratified it. Uh, the dispute is um, much smaller in a sense than the disputes between Turkey and Greece. There's no islands, no island problems <laughs> between Lebanon and Israel, so that's easier. But of course, the relationship with Israel and Lebanon is very tense. So to sum, I don't, uh, I don't think that uh, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, and Syria will form an organization of their, of their own. Uh, there are two, two concerns. One is that the EMGF, despite its promising start, might end in, in nothing. I mean, it will, uh, now it's an organization, but maybe at some point it will just be, just be an organization by name and not have any significance. I, I hope this is not the case. It's definitely not the case now, but that might be the future. And, uh, and there are attempts of the EU to diffuse tensions in the East Mediterranean to, to do some sort of form that will be basically in essence parallel to the EMGF, uh, but since it's, well, the Europeans organize it in an attempt to uh, de-escalate, then it will, then it will, will include Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dalia. Um, Louis, would you, like to, would you like to comment on that? I'll, I'll just say, first of all, I, I agree with Gal what Galia said completely. I think uh, the idea of, um, you know, Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon, I, I, I'll, I'll say that Cyprus and Lebanon have, have had a long enough uh, relations that you would expect something to come to the back door there. I think that's, that would be most likely. And of course, any coming together of Syria and, and Turkey right now is far beyond far beyond uh, imagining right now. I mean, who knows what what would happen uh, in the future? Maybe a post off of there. Uh, but I, I think what we're what we're coming back to, and and I want to say something what Celine said before about what you said about the the realigning of, of parties in Turkey, and 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 you know, Turkey really is on um, the brink of of possible changes. Uh, renegotiation coalitions, uh, different um, outlooks. Uh, it's not working inside Turkey right now. People know that the overwhelming population are, are unhappy with their, their personal situation. And it's just not because of the pandemic. It was pre-pandemic, but the pandemic has really, really brought it on. So, I, you know, we, and, and I, I do believe that um, Turkey's big change, and that's what I, I had sort of alluded to at the beginning, is going to be and, and, and what happens, what happens internally, what happens with human rights internally, what happens with, uh, I mean, we, we could go from, from so many different angles. And I, and I think that's sort of, you know, uh, is sort of how I, how I wanted to, it wasn't before that I was saying that Turkey is guilty of everything. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to make, make that point, but, but, but Turkey itself, um, you know, has, um, just such a zigzagging um, internal politics and external politics that, it, that it's really hard, it's hard to keep up with. Um, and um, that's why I say, you know, who knows, maybe there will be agreement, but maybe we'll wake up, a, you know, six months from now, a year, there'll, there'll be a, 
a, a nice agreement with with Israel that that you know. But but I think this this issue of trust, it's, it's everything, and do, it's just do you not mean, Israel. Do you mean between and Turkey with, and Israel? Yeah, between Turkey and Israel, but mm. Turkey and Egypt also that, that that mistrust. That's why I brought up the the picture of Erdogan in in Egypt. That 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 mistrust of of of, of Erdogan it, it goes beyond it goes beyond is, Israel. You know, I, I shared on Twitter that like two weeks ago, um, it was uh, you know the Greek Prime Minister in 2004 was the signator on on the wedding of Erdogan's daughter. So think about that. You know, we were we were at, we were at you know this point in the early, early 2000s where everything was possible. But that really, that really had, that's really, that's really passed. That's why when you talk about Le Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey, I sort of, it goes, it goes along with the, across the board. Turkey right now, um, if it doesn't work out internally, what's, what's going on, it's going to be very hard to make long-term changes in the, in the near future. I think maybe I'm wrong. By the way, I would like to make a, a brief comment on the, on the uh, Turkey's uh, joining the East Med Gas Forum. I mean, I also mentioned it, but uh, it also uh, uh, it sounds like maybe a wishful thinking because given the th uh, given the fact that the Palestinian Authority blocked uh, the UAE's uh, participation in the East Med Gas Forum, who will guarantee that uh, Cyprus or Greece wouldn't <laughs> block Turkey's participation? Uh, but uh, we, but of course, making it making uh, East Med Gas Forum a more inclusive uh, platform uh, would certainly uh, appease Turkey's concerns of being uh, under siege, being uh, isolated, so on and so forth. So uh, again, it comes down to what uh, the other actors like EU and the United States are willing to do and how much they are willing to, if they, whether or not they are willing to put their hands on under the, you know, uh, they, they want to uh, undertake that burden, we will see. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to abuse my position as the moderator or chair of the panel to ask one last question before, before we wrap up. Um, before we, we wrap the event up. Um, and my question is, with uh, post, do you think that post-Brexit Britain will be able to have more influence in the Eastern Mediterranean? Right? I mean, Britain has mentioned, Britain has, has, has emphasized that it seeks to play a much, um, a, a, a much more significant role in NATO. So do you think that this might give Britain more influence over Turkey or over uh, geopolitics in the Eastern Mediterranean? Well, I was wondering about this issue for quite a long time because uh, the United Kingdom has remained silent uh, when the tension escalated in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I uh, asked the same question to a former uh, ambassador uh, of uh, UK's former ambassador to Ankara, Peter Westmarket. And uh, he too agreed with me that the, uh, the Brexit, it is mostly because of the Brexit, uh, which consumed uh, UK's energy and then uh, the pandemic, of course, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, distracted the uh, UK from uh, devising uh, solutions and uh, being uh, more active uh, on the foreign policy front. But with the recent proposal uh, for Cyprus, I think the UK is trying to uh, trying to say that I'm back on the scene. So uh, trying to do something about it. And if they are really, if they want to accomplish and fulfill uh, the, the promise that uh, if UK is going to be a global power, uh, it needs to be uh, more active and engaged in uh, foreign, uh, foreign affairs and, uh, and, 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 then, and the resolution of disputes, of course, be a mediator, uh, uh, assume a mediating role in, for, in the settlement of disputes. Thank you, Selim. Dalia, any last thoughts on, on that? I would just uh, say that um, Britain uh, post Brexit is and its relations with the EU is actually uh, a good model for future uh, EU Turkish relations. This is something my colleague uh, at INSS of Iran has been saying for years. Basically, it used to be that uh, when the Europeans said to Turkey privileged partnership, it was an insult. Uh, but today, um, if Britain has this privileged partnership with the EU, maybe it's not so bad that Turkey will also have something like that. And 
by somehow relaxing tensions between the EU and Turkey, at least that there's no, I mean, I think the accession process does have its, 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 its benefits for Turkey. And it, 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 the fact that it's still alive is, is, is I mean, <laughs> Selina gave very nice metaphors. It's not really alive, but it's, it's, still, it's still there somehow. Um, it, it does have also positive effects, but at the end of the day, it's unsolved. And I think this, so the, the Britain, uh, the UK, uh, EU model might be good also for Turkey. Thank you, Gaia. Um, Louis, before any, any thoughts? You are. I got caught it by the mute and the unmute. Yeah. Uh, so you're not, I'm also uh, one of those that usually talk. I'll actually leave it uh, to their answers. Yeah. Ex excellent. Thank you so much. So we have to finish now. Um, and but if if members of the audience have any more questions, I'm sure they, they could contact the speakers. Um, and I would like to thank the speakers again for for a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it, and I hope you all enjoyed it. I think we got a very wide, a very broad perspective on um, on, on the Eastern Mediterranean and particularly Turkey and Israel relations. And um, yeah, um, so you all um, you know, take care and um, hopefully see you at other events. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Stay safe, stay sane. <laughs> everyone. Thanks to everyone for joining. Thanks so much. Thank you.